The Old Testament reading for the 13th Sunday after Pentecost is from Isaiah, the 29th chapter. The vision of all this has become to you like the words of a book that is sealed. When men give it to one who can read, saying, read this, he says, I cannot, for it is sealed. And when they give the book to one who cannot read, saying, read this, he says, I cannot read. And the Lord said, because this people draw near with their mouth and honor me with their lips, while their hearts are far from me and their fear of me is a commandment taught by men, Therefore, behold, I will again do wonderful things with this people, with wonder upon wonder, and the wisdom of their wise men will shall perish, and the discernment of their discerning men shall be hidden. Ah, you who hide deep from the Lord your counsel, whose deeds are in the dark, and who say, Who sees us? Who knows us? You turn things upside down. Shall the potter be regarded as the clay, that the thing made should say of its maker, He did not make me? Or the thing formed say of him who formed it, He has no understanding? Is it not every is it not yet a very little while until Lebanon shall be turned into a fruitful field, and the fruitful field shall be regarded as a forest? In that day the deaf shall hear the words of a book. And out of their gloom and darkness the eyes of the blind shall see. The meek shall obtain fresh joy in the Lord. And the poor among mankind shall exult in the Holy One of Israel. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle is from Ephesians, the fifth chapter. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the seventh chapter. When the Pharisees gathered to Jesus, with some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem. They saw that some of his disciples ate with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands, holding to the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other traditions that they observe such as the washing of cups and pots and copper vessels and dining couches. And the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? And he said to them, Well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, 
teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. You leave the commandments of God and hold to the tradition of men. And he said to them, You have a fine way of rejecting the commandments of God in order to establish your tradition. For Moses said, Honor your father and your mother, and whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But you say, If a man tells his father or his mother, Whatever you would have gained from me is korban, that is, given to God, then you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or mother, thus making the void, making void the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down. And many such things you do. This is the gospel of the Lord. St. Paul the Apostle, in his letter to the Christians in Colossae, in part writes these words. As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him, rooted and built up in Him and established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Beware, beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world and not according to Christ. For in Him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in Him who is the head of all principality and power. In the same chapter, a little bit later, St. Paul continues, Let no one judge you in food or in drink, or regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbaths, which are a shadow of things to come. But the substance is of Christ. Let no one cheat you of your reward, taking delight in false humility and worship of angels, intruding into those things which he has not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind and not holding fast to the head from whom all the body, nourished and knit together by joints and ligaments, grows with the increase that is from God. Therefore, if you died with Christ from the basic principles of the world, why, as though living in the world, do you subject yourselves to regulations? Do not touch, do not taste, do not handle. Which all concern things which perish with the using, according to the commandments and doctrines of men. These things indeed have an appearance of wisdom in self-imposed religion, false humility and neglect of the body, but are of no value against the indulgence of the flesh. The traditions and the commandments of men. These things that Paul is warning the Christians in Colossae about, there were those in their day, as there are those in our day too, that teach not the Word of God in its truth and purity, but teach rather their own ways in order to please God. That's exactly what we see in today's Gospel reading too, which does not at all sound like the Gospel at all because Jesus has some harsh words for the Pharisees and the scribes of His day. His disciples, that is, Jesus' disciples, were eating without washing their hands. Now we today might make a big deal out of not washing the hands, especially if they're dirty before eating, but not for spiritual or religious reasons. But the Jews of Jesus' day washed in a certain manner, in a certain way, for a certain duration of time. And they deem that such action indicated their cleanliness God. The traditions of men and the commandments of men that Jesus is pointing out 
has to do with those things that are contrary to the Word of God. Or even those things that are related to the Word of God. But are not done out of faith. You see, external things and what you do that people see does not mean that you're a Christian or not a Christian. Many view Christianity and the Christian faith as doing the right thing or at least looking good before others, being recognized for what you do, helping people and serving others. And yet before God, what is more significant than the external what is observable to faith in the heart. In the immediate context of today's gospel reading, just prior to these words of our Lord and those words of the Pharisees and the scribes who came to Jesus, Jesus had fed 5,000. He had healed many sick he had cast out demons. And by these actions, Jesus demonstrated who he was. And now by the scribes and the Pharisees questioning Jesus about his disciples, they are really trying to accuse him for not keeping their traditions. And really the point of all this Dialogue between Jesus and the scribes and the Pharisees, they still did not get. And they did not believe who Jesus himself claimed to be, according to his word, according also to his work. The Jews and scribes and the Pharisees of Jesus' day said they believed in God, which many do also today, whether Jews or Muslims or even Christians. Some even say that all worship the same God. And thus the people, they claim to honor God with their lips, but their heart is far from me because the Bible teaches us there is, there is only one way to serve God rightly. Not by what you do, but by what you believe. And I recognize that this is very politically incorrect today, to say today, but Muslims and Jews do not worship the same God as the same God. Is the God revealed in Holy Scripture? Neither do Jehovah's Witnesses or Mormons or other false religions teach the truth about who God is and what God has done. Because the Christian God is the only God, the only true God, who makes himself known through the flesh and blood of Jesus Christ, who suffered on the cross to save you from your sin, whose blood cleanses you from all unrighteousness. It's very easy to say, I believe in God very easy to confess the Christian faith. But it is very difficult to live out that Christian faith by faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus uses the words hypocrites in today's text. And there are some today who continue to deny the Christian faith. And accuse Christians because, or on the basis that they themselves are hypocrites. That Christians are hypocrites. And that is true. Christians are hypocrites, so is everyone else. The only difference between a Christian hypocrite and an unbelieving hypocrite is that the Christian hypocrite believes in Jesus Christ and trusts in Him alone for salvation. The 
unbelieving hypocrite takes no confidence in Jesus Christ. Even Paul himself, sometimes called the super apostle, in Romans chapter 7, declares that he does not do what he wants to do. He's a massive hypocrite. He knows what he should do, but he doesn't do it. And what he knows not to do, that in fact is what he does. Sounds a lot like us, doesn't it? We might know what to do, but we often fail to do it. We know what we shouldn't do, but we do it anyway. And then we tell others what they should or should not do, and that we do the opposite. If it wasn't for Christ, all of us would be lost. But true worship of God does not have to do with being perfect. That's what all other false religions will teach. What you do determines whether or not God is pleased with you. But the Christian faith is the only true faith that teaches true comfort and peace with God. Because the Christian faith teaches that it's not what you do that gets you right with God. It's what Christ did for you that you have peace with God. That's why Paul says in Romans chapter 5, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. Now, I'm not discounting good works at all here in the life of the Christian. But with reference to salvation, that is certainly the so, the case. Because good works follow the right faith. Think about it. In the world today, who does the greatest and the grandest of what appears to be good works? Who raises the most money by benefits and by dinners and the like for AIDS victims, for cancer research and the like? Likely it's not Christians, but unbelievers. But you see, it's not by what is done that determines your goodness, but rather what Christ has done. Consider these words from our Lord Jesus in another place, Matthew's Gospel, the seventh chapter, where Jesus says, Every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruits. What we deem as good in the eyes of the world is maybe not defined so by our Lord. We call people good all the time. That person's a good person. He does a lot of helpful things. And he or she might actually do a lot of helpful things, but that in and of itself, and those things that are done don't make that person good in God's eyes. Because in God's eyes, the person is good who first has faith in Christ Jesus. That's why we hear those words of St. Paul the Apostle, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Everything that is apart from faith is sin. Therefore, if there is not faith in Christ, then any works that are done are damning and condemning. so necessary to continue in the Christian faith, believing the very word and the promises of God. Because apart from faith, apart from Christ, we are lost. Only in Christ and with Christ, believing in Him, are we saved from sin and death and the power of the devil. That's why Jesus says in another place, Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. 
Therefore, you desire to worship God rightly and not in vain. You desire not to teach as the doctrines, the commandments of men. Then stick with his word. That's where the true and saving doctrine alone is found. Not in what man devises, not in what churches come up as the latest fad and drawing people in. Why do you think so many congregations that are televised on TV and that are heard here and there about are growing phenomenally, at least for the time being? We hear of congregations that have thousands upon thousands and thousands of members, but what are they teaching? Are they teaching the truth of God's word? Are they preaching about repentance? Are they preaching the truth about Jesus Christ? And how he took care of all your debt, all the sin, and the consequences of that sin through shedding his blood on the cross. Do they preach the truth of God's word? That man in no way is good, as you heard, as we read in today's psalm, from Psalm 14. The fool says in his heart, there is no God, there is no one who does good, not even one. Again, this is quoted by Paul in Romans chapter 3. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. God's servant, Paul. Do other places teach that? Teach the salvation of God through faith? Do they teach that true worship of God has to do with faith in the heart and not by what you externally do that people see? So common today to compromise the Christian faith for the sake of peace, whether in the congregation or in the world. And we have a very good way as sinners to excuse and justify our own actions and how we live. And yet here we must also deny ourselves and take up our crosses and follow Christ. It's so easy to go by the way of the majority. It's so easy to follow what others are doing because it seems right to us. Because it appeals to our senses because it's easier than standing firm on that which seems to be so divisive in today's world. And yet Jesus speaks of that too in today's gospel. When Jesus speaks about that thing called the Korban, he's talking about what the Jews of his day did with reference to their father and mother. They set aside perhaps a certain amount of money or offering that they said that was reserved for the Lord. And not, they did not necessarily have to use that money and offer it to the Lord. But let's say their parents were in need, father and mother needed some help. The child can simply say, that money is reserved for the Lord, I can't help you. And that was approved by the traditions of men. Jesus himself quoted Moses as saying, honor your father and mother, the fourth commandment, and he again notes words from the Old Testament where Moses says, whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. In the book of Leviticus, it's recorded that it is these words, everyone who curses his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. He has cursed his father or his mother, his blood shall be upon him. Such is the enormity of of disrespect and cursing parents in the Old Testament. And we could spend a lot of time talking about how that is lacking today. 
But Jesus says, Honor your father and mother, quoting Moses, and whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But then he notes to the Jews, the Pharisees, and the scribes, but you say, if a man tells his father or his mother, whatever you would have gained for me is korban, you no longer permit him to do anything for his mother, father or mother. In other words, they set aside things to God, and they neglected the very things that God himself had commanded. Yet hear these words from the fourth commandment, the large catechism, where Luther writes, learn what this commandment requires concerning honor to parents. You are to esteem and prize them as the most precious treasure on earth. In your words, you are to behave respectfully, respectfully toward them and not address them discourteously, critically, and censoriously, but submit to them and hold your tongue even if they go too far. You are also to honor them by your actions, that is, with your body and possessions, serving them, helping them, and caring for them when they are old, sick, feeble, or poor. All this you should do not only cheerfully, but with humility and reverence as in God's sight. He who has the right attitude towards his parents will not allow them to suffer want or hunger, but will place them above himself and at his side and will share with them all he has to the best of his ability. Honor those words. This too is what Jesus was referring to when he spoke with the Pharisees and the scribes of his day. And also the scribes and the Pharisees of our day too. We can say that we honor God all we want. But if we depart from the Lord's command and his word, it's not honoring God. It's simply not honoring God. Because we know what pleases God according to his word. And the Jews of Jesus' day and perhaps those of today, even Christians do this. I'm serving God. I can't do that. And yet, what would God have us do? Not only say that we're serving Him and do something else, but actually and literally be serving Him according to His will. And I'll say this, it's not the easiest thing to do. Because we continue to fight with ourselves with reference to serving our Lord. And yet, it is by means of God's Word by means of God's word that we know what in fact pleases him. Even if it is contrary to the ways of the world. Even if it is contrary to the way many Christians act or believe. Listen to these words of St. Paul the Apostle concerning providing for his own. He says, if anyone does not provide for his own and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. I kind of tend to think that the grass is greener on the other side. If we do what seems right and obey the benefit to us, we think that is pleasing to God. But perhaps what is pleasing to God is not what's on the other side of the field, but what's right in front of us. Before God, you have no excuses. But before God, you have no excuses also plead for mercy. And his mercy you had in Christ Jesus. Therefore you do not just honor God with your lips, but you trust in His compassion. You trust in His grace, which is found only in Christ Jesus. You trust in His forgiveness. Therefore, you seek not to walk in darkness, but seek to practice the truth. You say to yourself, or you call yourselves sinners, for you are. And thus, you don't deny what our Lord says about you. For you also know the promise of God. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. 
but we don't say that we haven't sinned. We say amen to the Lord's judgment of our sin, but we also say amen to His salvation. And thus do we confess His name loudly, boldly, and clearly. And thus do we seek also to do what is pleasing to Him. God 